Hi, I'm Nick Mandoli with Visual South. We're going to talk about the advanced material planning window in Infor Visual ERP in this video. In this first section of the video, we're going to look at how we can mass release purchase orders and work orders from the advanced material planning screen. Having the ability to mass release purchase orders and work orders is one of the key features of the advanced material planning window. To see how that works, let's first compare it to the standard material planning window. So for that, I'm going to go right over to my material planning window. And typically in the standard view, what we would do is pull up a part number and see what it is that we need to plan. I'm going to use the search feature so I can find everything that the MRP run told me meets the criteria for planned orders. So down in the bottom, I'm just going to choose purchase orders, but I can choose fabricated also for this exercise. But I'm going to say, just show me planned orders that I need to release maybe over the next 10 days. I'm going to hit search and I get a list here. If I start at the top of the list and just double click, load it on my screen, I can then see all of my demand, all of my supply, which in this case, my supply order is a bunch of purchase orders that are already out there. And then I have a few planned orders down toward the bottom. And typically in this window to release those planned orders, I just highlight a planned order or, or multiple lines with planned orders on them. And I'm going to do my firm release planned order button. From here, it knows the vendor, knows when I want them, and I can firm or release it and place the order and that will generate my purchase order. Same thing for work orders. So if this was a fabricated item, it would generate a work order instead of a purchase order. So that compared to the advanced material planning window, I'm just gonna change my view and say show advanced mode. And notice the difference in the view here is now we're looking at buckets of time. And I'm not calling them weekly buckets because I have the ability as the user to define what size buckets I want to see. So I can see uh, weekly buckets, monthly buckets, yearly buckets, daily buckets. Uh, it all depends on how I define my calendar and I can have multiple calendars because maybe I want to, you know, go back and forth and see it, you know, different ways. And I can mix and match, uh, which you'll see later on in this demonstration where I'm using the first month in weekly buckets and then I switch to bi-weekly buckets and then I go to monthly buckets toward the end of the, the list. So the difference here is rather than looking at a part by part or searching for parts, which I can still do and still release planned orders one at a time if I want, uh, but the nice thing about this is now I have the ability to say, just look at a specific bucket. I'll start with 129 because that's the current bucket we're looking at. And I'm just going to select a couple of buckets into the future. So really, I'm telling the system, go ahead and find all of those planned orders where the release date falls within these time buckets. And that's all I need. I don't need to go any further than that, because if it's further out there for a release date, it means I don't need to do anything with it. Uh, realistically, in a perfect world, I would only select this week's buckets and release what the system is telling me I need to release now. So by selecting those buckets, I can now come up and click the same firm release planned order. And I'm going to get this new window. I'm just going to expand that. And it's going to show me a list of everything that falls within those time frames. So my release dates in this case is most of them are on 130. I have some 25, some 212s and so on. Uh, but this is really showing me everything that I need from a purchasing standpoint. And actually, this is showing me both when it first opens, both purchased items and uh, fabricated items. So once it does open, I can, you know, if I am the purchasing person, I say, just choose purchased. I only want to see my purchased item, not all my planner's parts. So once I do that, I also have the ability now to filter even further, whether I'm doing it by product code, commodity code, uh, planner or buyer, if you use an IDs for those, for the different items. I can also say what kind of purchase order number generation do I want? I'm just gonna use the next sequence, which is the most common thing, but I can tell it to use the want date with the part ID as part of that purchase order number for some folks that would like to do that. Uh, my purchase order rules. Do I wanna consolidate by vendor? Meaning, if I have multiple items that go to the same vendor on here, if I choose all of those, automatically put them all on the same purchase order. Otherwise, I can choose single part per order, which will create a separate purchase order for each part, even if it's going to the same vendor. Obviously, this is the uh, beneficial way to do it with consolidating by vendors, because you eliminate the number of purchase orders that you're creating. Purchase order line item rules. Do you want delivery schedules? In other words, if the same item is requested multiple times, uh, do I want to put one line item for that 
particular part number with the total quantity on it, and then also create delivery schedules to break out the different deliveries if there's different need dates. If I just want to make separate lines on the purchase order instead of delivery dates, I can do that also. So choose how you want it, and then the, all you would do is look at what you need and what you want to release in the list. You can pick and choose by holding the control key down. And maybe there's one that you're not going to buy right now, so I'll just skip some and choose the ones I want. I can see who the vendor is. I can see the vendor's name. I could also see some planning information to make my decision a little bit easier. Maybe I'm below safety stock and that's why I'm needing this as opposed to uh, demand. Choose what I want and then just say order. And when I click order, that's going to generate purchase orders. It also recognizes if I don't have a, if I selected a line that doesn't have a vendor, which I've selected quite a few that don't have vendors. So it would want me to select the vendor from the list before continuing to place those purchase orders. Okay. And it will let me go through. It'll just leave those on the list for me to fix, but it will create the purchase orders for everything else that did have vendors associated with it. Again, same thing for work orders. So if I choose fabricated instead of purchased, now I'm looking at work orders. I can do the same thing where I can combine similar part numbers. So now I can use the next number. I can consolidate work order quantity. So rather than creating three different work orders, I'm going to consolidate the three that are needed on. I have two actually needed on the same day in, in my demo environment and one due uh, on an earlier date, but it would combine them into one work order with that earlier want date being the due date. Same thing, consolidate. I can choose those three and say order. It'll create a work order. In this case, it's going to be one order and lets me know it firmed them and drops them off my list. So this whole page becomes a to-do list, both for purchasing and for uh, releasing planned work orders to the floor. Now let's take a look at how we can handle forecasting and master scheduling using demand fences with the advanced material planning window. To demonstrate this, we want to start off with part maintenance just to show how a master schedule part is set up. In this case, I'm using this MMT 1996 DM in our planning tab. This part is a master scheduled order policy. That tells us that we're going to use the master scheduling to determine how we want to plan this part. With advanced material planning, the demand fences come into play. So demand fence one and two, I have on this particular part, I have it set to 30 and 60. There's a global setting, which you can use if you don't put the demand fences in here that the system will use, uh, or you could do it by product code. The highest level, the first level that it will look at is at the part level. So I can be specific by part, which kind of demand fences I want. What this demand fence represents in a master schedule is during that first time phase up to 30 days, we're telling the system only use real demand or only look at real demand for planning purposes. After the 30 days, we're gonna look at the higher of real demand or our master scheduled, which comes from a forecast, uh, demand. So it's going to choose the higher from 31 out to 60. And then beyond 60 days in that third bucket, really it's going to keep looking at whatever we put in that master schedule or forecast. So going back to our material planning window, we're already in the advanced view. And this time we are going to put a part number in there. We're going to use that part number that we were just looking at in the previous example of that MMT 1996 DM. And here we are looking at those date buckets again, except now it's looking different because we have some options on the side to look at. And if you look, we're looking at inventory across the top. I have 272 of these available currently in inventory. So everything's going to be netting off of that when it starts looking at our master schedule. I can see my planned orders. So MRP ran and these are the numbers it came up with. And then it has a suggestion. So it compares what it actually did versus what they think you should have done. Because again, a master schedule is you telling it what you want it to do. So it's not necessarily looking at real demand just yet. We're going to tell it to look at real demand, but which is what that suggestion is going to be. And it lets us know if we have any current firmed orders. At any time, if we click on any of these boxes, we can see what those are. So we can see the detail behind uh, what's in those boxes. Right, I can see my current firmed orders. And then we have gross supply. 
uh, gross supply is really the total of what our inventory is and then adding in any of those uh, firm planned orders or MRP planned orders that are it's suggesting we create. This is gonna come into play in a little while when we show you how we use those demand fences. Then you can also see that I have forecasts. So I have one that's a customer, Able Manufacturing, so I brought in a forecast on these date buckets. We forecasted those amounts. And then I created a, my own forecast. I just called it Nick Forecast, but I can have as many forecasts in here as I want. The star represents the status of that forecast, meaning that these are both active. I want to use numbers from both of these. Uh, as opposed to, you know, having multiple forecasts possibly, but I'm only going to use one, so I'll only leave one active, but still be able to view uh, the others if I wanted to switch. Uh, but here I'm doing a combination, because maybe you get, if you sell the same item to multiple customers, you can have a different forecast for each customer, and you could load those in there, and then it's going to come up with a gross demand and total those up for you. Okay, so the gross forecast is, you know, the total of any active forecasts. Then we're going to look at actual customer demand. You can see I have a bunch of customer orders in the system for this item. That's creating real customer demand. Dependent demand would be if this was a material that went into a parent item. So if it was a sub assembly or a sub component material, uh, in this case, it's a finished good. It wouldn't have any dependent demand in it. And then of course, gross demand is the total of all of that demand if you had both uh, customer and dependent demand. And gross demand is really what the system is gonna calculate here when we tell it we want to use those demand fences. Right. And then of course, a projected inventory. That's similar to the middle column that you see on your standard view when you're, when you're looking at the ins and outs uh, and how everything's affecting inventory along the way in those date buckets. Right. We're trying to avoid negatives or we wanna make sure that we create supply for those negatives along the way. And our current master production schedule. This is what is everything is really related to. So if I click on that, I can see what my current master schedule is, meaning these are the numbers that we told it we're gonna want to make during all of these time buckets. When you first create a master schedule, it's usually uh, copied from a forecast. And then of course it's gonna change within those demand fence windows because it was close to the forecast, but I really want to plan toward, you know, that real customer demand in the first 30 days and then the higher of the two in the next, you know, 30 days after that and so on, depending on how you set those demand fences up. The ability to load a forecast. This is one of the functions of the advanced planning is I can come in and create a planning forecast. The nice thing about this is having the ability to export and import to Excel. So creating a forecast from the beginning is very easy because if I export it to Excel, I can choose either a range of parts or a range of product codes, uh, start and end date. So if I'm doing it based on last year, perhaps I would put 1123 to, to 123124 and tell it to look at all shipments and issues, all outgoing transactions. This way I could base my new forecast on that. That would get exported to Excel, and then I can modify it all in Excel if I want to add 3% or, or change things you know, accordingly in Excel, and then I can import it back in. I could take last year's numbers, modify them using Excel, which everybody knows, it's easy to use, uh, and import that back in to generate my forecast for the next year. And you can see I have those two forecasts with those numbers in here that I imported from, from Excel. Once those numbers are in, notice the color changes I have. I have black in everything in the past. So my current bucket, date bucket for today, which today is 130 2024 so it's beyond that 129 date, but my current date bucket is this February 5th, 2024. And then it goes out to 30 days, because again, I set my first demand fence to 30 days for this particular part. So those first 30 days are gonna highlight in green, representing demand fence one. Demand fence two is the next 30 days, which are highlighted in blue. And then beyond that is black again. That's that is considered the forecast zone. So it, it maintains that, that original master schedule copied from the forecast. Since things change, the reason we have those demand fences here is we have a forecast, we turned that into our master schedule, but you know our real demand is not quite meeting that. So we want to make sure that we're uh, copying real demand in that first bucket. So the easy way to do that is to simply go back to 
our master production schedule. And what I'm going to want to choose over here is going to be my gross demand. Because again, that is going to be my real demand from either customers, uh, customer orders or work orders at a higher level demanding this item. So this is, this is what's real within those time buckets that I selected. So I want to copy that real gross demand using those uh, buckets up to my current MPS. So I select the line that I want to use to copy it up. And I'm going to say copy to MPS. Right. So now my MPS up top is going to match that demand down on the bottom based on those calculations for that gross demand. I'm going to save that, close that. Now, if I rerun my MRP, I should see these turn to positives. I'm going to do that real quick because it runs fast, reprocess everything. And you can see it actually turned to zero and I have mine set so I don't see zeros on my screen. So I could tell that my beginning inventory now, since I don't have safety stock set up on this part, otherwise I would see a safety stock uh, quantity up here. Uh, but it's it's even across. So what the system did was was take that those rules I created, take my gross demand and copy that up. And now my planning is creating exactly what I told it to based on my rules. I can go look at my planned orders that are slightly different than they were before now. This was just a quick overview of what you can do with Visual's advanced material planning window. For more information, contact us at visualsouth.com. Thank you for watching.